detection mechanisms. Well, what is it? Well, you can see the definition here. But before I talk about that, let me remind you that this is part of chemical kinetics. Chemical kinetics is concerned with the rate of a re chemical reaction, which we've already done, and the mechanism of a reaction. Mechanism, what is it? A series of steps by which reacting particles rearrange themselves to form products in a chemical reaction. So, for example, as you can see here, 2A plus B yields A2B. It's just a regular old chemical reaction. But mechanism is a little bit different. That's the reason I'm wearing this hat. You'll see in a minute. So, normally we would think if I take two A's and one B, like we see here, I can just kind of put them together and get an A2B, almost like Legos. Two A's and a B gives an A2B. Makes sense to me. But that's actually not what happens. Between the reactants and products, a variety of different things. Reaction mechanisms. This is the end of the section about chemical kinetics. Remember, kinetics is dealing with the rate of a chemical reaction and a mechanism of a reaction. And that's what we're going to deal with here. What is a mechanism? Why, it's a series of steps by which reacting particles rearrange themselves to form products in a reaction. So, the one you see here, 2A plus B yields A2B, is an example of a chemical reaction. If we think about it, it makes sense if I take two A's and a B and put it together somehow, it's going to get A2B. But it doesn't do it like you see here. It's not like a Lego set where we take two A's and a B, click them together, and we get something else. Actually, what happens is much more complex than what we see here. It's almost like if I said to you, I got up this morning, 6.30 a.m., and I came home from work at 5. Well, between 6.30 a.m. and 5 p.m., a whole lot happened to me. But if you're just looking at the beginning and end, you can't necessarily see what's happening in the middle. So the reaction mechanism is the things that happen in the middle. So let's look at it with an analogy. And I'm going to talk about it similar to letter writing. Now, letter writing is a lost art. Right now, we have the computer, we have our iPads, we have our phones, we have all kinds of technology. We can Skype with people, we can Facebook with people, we can IM with people, and who knows what else we'll be able to do in the next couple of years. But letter writing used to be the way of communication. So that's what I'm going to show you here in a picture. And for this, I'm going to use white because the background's blue. So I also realize that my picture is going to, with this beautiful hat, which was influenced by letter writing, you'll see in a minute, um, is over in the corner. So I'm going to draw my picture over to the left. Hopefully it won't interfere too much. All right, so here is a picture of my house. There it is. And my actual house really does kind of look like that. There it is. And right next to my house is mailbox. You might think it's a thumb, but it's not. It's actually a mailbox. This kind of mailbox is the kind of mailbox you see when you go to, um, let's say, a shopping center. One of those blue mailboxes where you pull down the drawer and you stick your letter in it and close it, and then the postal delivery person picks it up. Not the kind at the end of the mail, you know, at the end of your driveway. So this is a U.S. Postal Service box, kind of near my house. All right, you'll also notice I live in a very flat and rural area, I will tell you. And next to my house is a creek, pretty big creek. Okay, there it is, it's rushing, you can see, just like that. And over that creek is a bridge, All right, there's the bridge. Now. Right next to the bridge, whoops, is a large and frightening looking mountain. You can see how steep it is. 
and there's a reason for that in a minute. Now, this is all right next to this creek. And of course, on the other side of the creek, before I talk about the mountain, there's some nice green, green grass. This is where the grass grows the nicest. It's so green and fresh. Okay, so I'm going to draw the pretty green, green grass. Although it's not green, but it's white. So there it is. Doesn't that look tasty? If you were a goat, for example. All right, anyway. So here's my house down here, and the mailbox near my house right there, right by the bridge. Now, I have a very good friend. My very best friend lives right here. She lives in a house kind of like mine. And there it is up there. As luck would have it, there is also a postal box near her house up on the top of this mountain. Now, it's kind of hard to get up the mountain, so I'm going to show you the road to get there. It's a series of switchbacks. It's kind of like what happens if you're going to hike the Grand Canyon and you're going to go down, down, down. There's a lot of back and forth because it can actually hurt your feet if you're doing a lot of hiking going at a, a steep angle. So look at this crazy road. It's going around the back of the mountain and etc. And finally, okay, there's her house. So that's a pretty big walk if I have to go to her house. So in any case, think of this as being extremely rural, you know, out in the countryside. In fact, there is really no cell phone service here and I can't even get good internet. So the only way to communicate with my friend is by writing her a letter. All right, so let's see how it works. So the first thing I'm going to do is I am, I'll put it over here. I'm going to write my letter. And I take out some nice stationery. I write a couple of pages of notes. I tell her all about what's happening in my, my area, you know, and any kind of gossip, whatever. So that, that happens. The next thing I do is I put the um, put the letter in the envelope because that's how you mail things, obviously. And I have to put a stamp on it, so I'll just put stamp. But you know what I mean. I have to dress it. I put the stamp on it. Then, of course, I have to walk it to the post box. So deposit and box. Now, this is the part that influenced my hat. So we're going to think, all right, what normally happens if you put a, put a letter in a post box, what do you think happens? Well, eventually the, the postal delivery person will come and take it out. Because I live in such a rural area, however, something special happens. So you'll notice this whole setup. Remember, there's a big bridge with this river or creek and some green, green grass. I will also tell you, which I didn't tell you earlier, there are three goats that live nearby. And they always are interested in going over this bridge. And in fact, they tend to go over the bridge because they want to eat that green, green grass on the other side. But who lives under the bridge? Some of you may already know. And I'm going to show you the book that it comes from if you don't already know. This is my kid version of the book. The Three Billy Goats Gruff, of course, are the three goats. And who lives under the bridge? There's the guy on the back with the crazy hat in the book I have. And thus, I decided to put on a crazy hat. This is the troll. So I'm going to draw a picture of the troll. So there's the crazy hat. Almost looks like a witch. Can't draw too well. Too small. But you get the idea. There's the troll. The troll lives under the bridge. And in the story, if you read it, what ends up happening is the, the goats want to get over the bridge to get to the green, green grass on the other side. But the troll doesn't want to let them pass. In fact, the troll wants to eat the goats. But anyway, you'll have to read the book if you don't know the story. So who lives under the bridge? The troll lives under the bridge, of course. Now, in this story, the troll doesn't eat any goats. Good thing. What the troll does, however, is the troll actually works for the U.S. Postal Service. It's hard to believe, but true. And what does the troll do? He delivers the mail. And because I live in a rural area, what he can do is he can go pick up my mail in my box, get the mail out of there. He can hand stamp it. He doesn't have to bring it to the main post office. 
if it's in his delivery route, he can deliver it. So the next step in the series of steps, he, the troll, gets the letter out of the mailbox. Then the troll has to get up to deliver the letter. Now how does the troll have to go? Well, the troll has to go up this steep mountain. So a troll walks up the hill. And as you know, all postal delivery people do a lot of walking. And it doesn't matter if it's raining, sleeting, hailing, doesn't matter. They, they go in any weather. So the troll walks up the hill. Seven, step seven is my friend gets letter. And then finally, my um, friend, once she gets the letter, she reads letter. And then the whole process can start over again, meaning she can write me a letter, she puts it in her mailbox, the troll can collect it, the troll can deliver it to me, etc. Now, I noticed that the whole process of this letter writing from my house all the way to my friend's house and back takes about one week. That's a whole long time. So I say to myself, this is ridiculous. By the time I get my friend's information from a week earlier, I already know it. You know, maybe something happened and I already figured it out. So this is old news. I want some fresh news. I want something a little bit more quickly. And remember, I don't have internet, so I can't look at it right away. Nobody's tweeting it. So what do I do? Well, um, I say to myself, all right, I am going to pre-address some envelopes with the stamps already on them. So when I write a letter, in fact, I'm going to write a one-page letter. When I write my one-page letter and put it in that pre-stamped envelope, I can, we can get ready to roll. In fact, maybe if I write my letter right next to the mailbox, things would be a little faster. Now, what do you think happens, actually? Let's say I wrote a shorter letter and I pre-stamped the envelopes. And I even sat outside and wrote my letter on the box to try to help things out it still takes about a week. Even if my friend runs to the t delivering troll with her letter and opens it up, the problem obviously is the troll walking up the hill because the troll must be slowed down by this crazy walk that he has to do, or she. In this book, however, it's a, a boy troll. So uh, the troll walking up the hill takes a lot of time. So we would call this step obviously the slow step or the rate determining step. So it determines the rate of the reaction. In other words, if the troll can't move any faster up that hill, that letter isn't going to be delivered any more quickly. Now, maybe the troll can use a goat. Goat can walk faster. Maybe the troll can get a helicopter. You know, whatever speeds up, in this case, step number six, is going to shorten the time of the writing of the letter and the receiving of the letter and the return of the letter from my friend. So that's the idea with the series of steps. Remember, a mechanism is a series of steps that happen. So if we want to think about this as I write a letter to my friend, and in the end my friend gets the letter and I receive one back, a whole lot happens in between me depositing my letter in the mailbox and me receiving a letter from my friend in, at home. You know, we didn't know anything about the troll and the whole walk and all this other kind of stuff that might have slowed the reaction down. So you might remember from the last section, let me just show you, there's the reaction 2A plus B yields A to B. So let's look at a mechanism. Here is an example of a mechanism. Notice it's a series of steps. A plus B yields AB, and A plus AB yields A2B, and A2B plus C yields A2BC. Now, a mechanism will always be provided for you. You have to interpret it, so don't worry about how this three-step mechanism was derived. You'll also notice they show you that step number two is the slow step. It means it's the rate determining step. It's causing us to slow down. Sometimes this slow step is the first step, or the second, or the third, or the fifteenth step. In this example, it just happens to be the second step. So let's look. Oh, I gave you the answer. I don't want to do that. Um, let's
let's look at the net equation. In other words, if I added all these things together, which I showed you oh so briefly, I guess you could uh, rewind a little bit and see the answer. But don't do that. See if you can get it yourself. Uh, this is how you can get it. We can add these things just straight down. So therefore, you could collect everything that's on the left and put it on the left of the arrow, everything on the right on the right, and then you could reduce. So if I do that, I'm going to get the answer. But I'm also going to show you a shortcut to reduce before you add. So technically, if I didn't want to reduce, I could have a plus b plus a plus ab plus a2b plus c all on the left, and ab plus a2b plus a2bc all on the right. And then I could reduce later. But I'm going to show you a trick to make it faster. If a substance is on the left of the arrow, and the same substance appears on the right, they can be canceled, even if they're in different steps. So let's see. Do you notice how AB can cancel? And A2B can also cancel? So I don't actually have to waste my time writing them, because I know they're going to cancel. Then when I start adding, I will notice I can add like terms, just like in math. So I have how many A's here? I have two A's, and I have a B, and I have a C. Now, I'm putting them in alphabetical order, but you could have put it C plus B plus 2A, or B plus 2A plus C. It doesn't, the order really doesn't matter. Let me make that a better looking arrow. And then we have A2BC. Let's see if we were right. I'm going to go ahead. Yep, we were. Okay, so this is the net equation. Now, you'll notice there are some things going on here. There are some things that cancel. These things that cancel, like AB and A2B, do you notice the first time you see them in the mechanism, the series of steps, they appear as products? The first time, AB is a product of the first reaction, and then it's used up and goes away. And then A2B is a product, and is used up and goes away in the third. If something appears as a product initially, and goes away and doesn't make it to the net equation. This is called an intermediate. An intermediate is kind of like an activated complex. It's a substance, actually a chemical, that is formed and then is used up goes away as part of that reaction. So AB actually doesn't even appear in the net reaction. Neither does A to B. That's why they are called intermediates. So let's look at this example. Now my guess is, because I can't see the recording while it's happening, my guess is part of my lovely hat and face is obstructing a little bit of this slide. Hopefully you can see the top half, so don't worry about it. We'll go through the bottom half and hopefully um, I will read it to you so you'll know what it says. So here's another reaction. The reaction between NO and H2 is believed to occur in the following three-step process. So there it is. And this one is not generic. You know, the previous one I used A's and B's and C's. Here, this is actually nitrogen monoxide and carbon and hydrogen, etc. So these are these are real chemicals. You'll also notice this one happens to have the second step as the slow step. Well, that was just good luck again. So what does it ask us to do? It asks us to, asks us to write a balanced equation for the overall reaction. In other words, we're going to add it up, just like I did before. So let's see how to do it. And I'm going to use my tricks of trying to reduce before I add. So essentially I'm going to add these three together. Alright, and I'm going to start canceling things out. N2O2C is here. I see carbon here. And N2O, here's another N2O. H2, N2, waters. Okay, so I think that's it. So that means I have two NOs and two H2s. Okay, 
producing N2 plus two waters. I think that's it. Now, the other thing that's interesting about a mechanism is the net overall reaction that I just wrote should be balanced. It should work. So let's check it out. Um, two N's, two N's, two O's, two O's, and four H's, four H's. Check. So that probably is right. Um, 2NO plus 2H2 yields N2 plus 2H2O. So that's the overall reaction. Let's identify the intermediates. Well, remember those are the things that first is formed as a product the first time you see it. That would be N2O2 and N2O. Those two are products the first time you see them. The next one asks you to identify the catalyst in the reaction. Now, we haven't seen this word in a little bit. Catalyst, remember, is a chemical that lowers the activation energy. It, it's the same at the beginning and the, is the same at the end. So it enters into the reaction and goes away. It's a lot like an intermediate, but a catalyst is a reactant the first time. it's seen and is not in the net equation. So it's not in the net equation, it's just um, goes away because it's just a helper. It's not really part of the reaction. So let's identify the catalyst. That happens to be carbon when I put an X through. You notice the first time you see it in the series of three steps, it's a reactant the first time. So that is a catalyst. Now, last part of this question, I'm actually going to erase all the circles so that you can see the mechanism pretty well. And this comes into the idea about the slow step. Remember, in this equa equation, series of steps. The second one is the, the um, slow step. It says, well, changing the concentration of NO increase the rate. Now, remember, in the last section, we talked about reactants, and if we increase the concentration of a reactant, it increases the rate of reaction, because the concentration is greater. There's more collisions. You notice there are two reactants here, NO and H2. So the question is, do you think NO will increase the rate? Well, we think probably it will, right? from what we knew before, but now that we have the mechanism, we can see if it really will increase the rate. So let's look at this series of steps. And if we notice where NO is located, you see that? NO is located in the fast step. Well, we think NO might have a big influence, but actually it probably doesn't have a very big influence because it's like the troll and the letter writing. If I increase, you know, the speed at which I get to the mailbox, it's really not going to change the overall rate. It might take off a few minutes, but it's certainly not going to change the overall rate of reaction. So unless the reactant is in the slow step, it won't change the rate of reaction significantly. Let's look at the next question. Will changing the concentration of H2 increase the rate? You know, H2 is a reactant, too. Let's figure out where H2 is. Well, H2 is in the second and the third step. Now, will that change the rate of reaction? Well, it won't change it because of the third step, but it will change the rate of reaction because it's in the slow step. So if I increase the concentration of H2, then the second step has a greater chance of moving faster. And that was the thing that was slowing us down just like the troll. The troll going up that steep sloped hill was a very slow step. If there's a way to increase that rate, we can have a chance of increasing the rate of the entire reaction.